Hello, everybody. My name is Casey Reese, and I'm an educator here at Wonders of Wildlife National Museum and Aquarium. I hope everyone is doing well, and thank you for joining us for our new Ocean Appreciation Mission. So in order for you to participate in our new Ocean Appreciation Mission, all you have to do is log on to www.wondersofwildlife.org backslash mission dash conservation. And on that website, you will be able to find out how to download our Agents of Discovery app. So on this Agents of Discovery app, you can find our new Ocean Appreciation Mission, which is a AR kind of similar to Pokemon Go platform. It's an educational platform. It's really fun for you to do. You can do it inside. You can take these triggers. If you scroll down, you can go find some triggers to print out. You can take those, put them outside all around and create your own scavenger hunt. Also with that, you do not even need to have a printer. You can use your phone and you can scan those triggers uh, on your phone and on the computer. So with that, we also have um, if you scroll down on our website, we also have um, an activity guide for you guys to uh, participate in. So you will scroll down under schedule of missions and activities. You will find our Agent Salmon and it says Agent Salmon Ocean Appreciation. So that is where you will find out how to create a craft, do an outdoor activity and how you can save the ocean, which who doesn't want to do that? So with that as well, once you have finished and completed the ocean appreciation mission, that is where you will unlock your mission reward, which is a Snapchat filter that you can use. So we have a special guest with us today from the Cabrillo Aquarium in Los Angeles. How are you doing, Zach and Zoe? Hey, good. I'm doing great, thank you so much. Awesome, so what do you have for us today? Well, today um, we are going to be talking a little bit about kelp forest, but just a quick introduction of who we are. Uh, like you said, this is Zoe. My name is Zach. We're from the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium in San Pedro, California. We're located in, in Southern California uh, next to Los Angeles. And we're in a really special spot uh, where, where we're right in the middle of some cold water and some warm water uh, off of our coast. And we get a lot of different animals. But first off, I want to talk to you a little bit about what's behind me right here. This is our kelp forest tank, our simulated kelp forest tank that represents the kelp forest that we have right off of our coast. And as you can take a look here, you see that there are these big long blades of, of kelp that are growing up. And usually there's gonna be a whole bunch of this. Uh, it makes a great area for animals to hide in. Uh, it makes a great area for smaller animals uh, like snails and things to grow up around the stalks of these. And it provides food for a lot of animals as well. Um, we have some really incredible animals that live here. We have a lot of rockfish. Uh, here we have some uh, sheephead. We have our California state fish called the Garibaldi. Um, and that's just a little bit about uh, what's directly behind me, our kelp forest. What I want to uh, do right now is I'm gonna pass it on over to Zoe. And she's gonna describe a little bit about what our kelp is and what that looks like. Awesome, right over to you, Zoe. All right. So the kelp forest is made up of a specific species of seaweed called giant kelp, which you kind of see a picture of that behind me. And giant kelp can be found along the coast of California. It particularly likes really cold, nutrient-rich water. Now, I'm gonna show you guys a model of kelp that we have right here, and I'll show you the different parts of kelp. So it's actually quite similar to plants on land. However, there are some big differences with them. Um, just like plants on land, kelp, as well as other seaweeds, do photosynthesis. So they take energy from the sunlight and convert that into energy that they use. And then as a byproduct of that, they then produce oxygen, which, of course, we need to breathe here. So there's actually quite a lot of oxygen that we breathe on land that comes from the kelps and the seaweeds and even the phytoplankton that are in the ocean. So just like plants on land, they have these leaf type things that are actually called blades. And this is where most of the photosynthesis actually occurs. Attached to these blades, they have these bubbles, which are called nematocysts. And they're filled with air or gas. And this helps keep the kelp floating up towards the surface so that it can get lots of sunlight for it to grow. They have a stipe which is kind of like the stem of a plant. And then they have down at the bottom, this thing that kind of looks like a root system, 
but it's actually called a hold fast. And it does something completely different than roots. It does not absorb nutrients from the soil. It does not absorb water and bring it up towards the plant. It only holds on to either the bottom of the ocean or to things like rocks. So this is a actual specimen of a dried holdfast. And you can see that this one has anchored itself really tightly down to this rock. Now, even though this is a really good form of anchoring the plant or anchoring the seaweed, um, still sometimes it can wash up onto the beach and then we find specimens like these. Now, kelp needs a lot of that sunlight to grow and they can actually grow about three feet in an entire day. So they're a really fast growing type of seaweed um, and very abundant off of our coast, especially during certain times where maybe the water is colder as opposed to our warm water. So we're gonna go take a look at one of the really important animals that we actually have over at the, uh, in the kelp forest. So I'm gonna move on over and you guys are gonna see this animal over here called a sea urchin. I'm gonna move my camera around a little bit. So sea urchins are one of the uh, really important residents of the kelp forest. These guys are, um, they belong to a big group of animals called echinoderms, which just means that they are spiny skinned animals. And it also includes sea stars, um, sand dollars, sea cucumbers. And let's, I'm gonna pick one up, see if I can grab it. They stick on pretty tight here. Let's take a look. So obviously these animals are pretty spiny, right? They have lots of spines all over their body for protection. And believe it or not, they are related to sea stars. It's kind of hard to tell, um, but even sea stars, they do have either rough or spiny skin. So those spines are one of their adaptations that help protect them out in the ocean. There aren't a lot of animals that would want to eat a spiny animal such as this. So if you flip over a sea urchin, you can actually see its mouth right here. Their mouth is comprised of a jaw system that has five little teeth. I'm gonna show you guys what the teeth look like here. So this is just one section of the jaw. Their jaw, the whole jaw structure is called an Aristotle's lantern, because when it's all put together, it does kind of look like a lantern. This is just one piece of it. And at the very end of the jaw, you can actually see its tooth. So that's just one of their teeth. And you might wonder what sea urchins eat with these jaws and their teeth. Well, they live in the kelp forest, so they actually eat kelp, um, along with a lot of other animals. A lot of other animals eat kelp as well. So if we kind of watch what our sea urchins are doing down here, you'll see lots of squiggly things coming off of our sea urchins. Now those are called tube feet. And those tube feet are how they can move around down on the ocean floor. It helps them stick to things. Those tube feet are pretty sticky. It helps them feel around for their surroundings as well as for their food, which is kelp, like I said. All right, so those are their tube feet. This one that we have down here, this one is called a purple sea urchin. And then the one that we have further and back down there, that is the red sea urchin. And those are probably the two most common sea urchin species that we have here in Southern California, or the red and the purple. So to get a better look at our sea urchins, we're gonna take a look at them underneath a microscope. We have a microscope camera that we're gonna switch to right now mm. in just a second. And what you guys will see in our microscope uh, camera is that you'll get to see all of those tube feet really up close as well as the spines and then you might even see some other really cool appendages. So I have a question for you Zoe. Go ahead. So sea urchins are um, similar to sea stars. So do they have the same water vascular system that they have? They do, yeah, that's a great question. So um, if you guys don't know, the water vascular system 
is how sea stars are able to actually move their arms and their tube feet because they don't have blood or bones or anything like that to actually move their appendages. So they pump water in through their body and that water circulates throughout their body and then they're able to move those tube feet and their arms. So the sea urchins are able to move those tube feet with their water vascular system, just like sea urchins or just like sea stars. It's a great Very question. Very cool. Very cool. So do they have the same stomach structures as well? Like the the cardiac stomach and the pyloric stomach, or is it different? So um, from what I understand, I believe it's different. Uh, so the sea stars, they're able to push their stomach outside of their body to actually eat their food. Whereas the urchins, they have, uh, they have their jaw structure in their teeth. So they don't have to push their stomach outside of their body. So Very cool. we have our microscope camera hooked up there. Try to get that in focus. It's a little dark. While you're getting that focus, I actually do have one more question for you. Go ahead. So you said earlier that kelp have nematocysts. Is that nematocysts like how jellies have that stinging cell? No, so they're actually, um, they sound the same, but they are spelled in two different ways. The jellyfish nematocysts, those are their stinging cells. And then the kelp nematocysts are those air-filled bladders that help them float up to the surface. So two different, um, two different structures. Okay, awesome. Thank you for All right. that. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for the questions. All right, so here we have our sea urchin underneath the microscope. You'll actually get to see up close, they have their um, spines. And then any of the little things you see wiggling around, those are their tube feet. Now, it might be a little hard to see, but if you can look really, really close, you might find um, some little appendages that look like pincers. And those pincers are called pedicellaria. And what the pedicellaria help them do is it actually helps them break off little pieces of kelp for them to eat. And then they'll slowly start to move that down towards the bottom where their mouth is. So three different appendages that they have all over their body, the spines, the tube feet, and the pedicellaria. It's a pretty cool, pretty cool uh, little view that we have here. Nice, all right. So we're actually gonna go switch over to our different camera, where Zach is gonna talk a little bit about some of the predators of sea urchins and how they're important to our natural habitat here. Awesome, thank you so much, Zoe. Uh, so what we're gonna be talking about here is an animal that is super cute and cuddly. We have our, our wonderful sea otter. Uh, here's a, an example, this guy is no longer alive. He is uh, stuffed and preserved and he gets to stay here at the aquarium. Um, but this is a really cool example of how, sea, how big sea otters can be. Uh, they're not super small. We also see just underneath this sea otter that there uh, is a bunch of food underneath him. We have these several crabs. We have a bunch of clams, mussels, abalone, and sea urchin. Um, and this is a really good example of how much food these sea otters can eat in one day. So a sea otter like this is going to be eating about 25 to 35% of its body weight a day. So this entire plate of food, pretty much just a day's worth uh, of, of food for the sea otter. Now, sea otters are incredibly important to our ecosystem of our kelp forest. Uh, we learned this a little bit the hard way. Uh, what I wanna talk to you about though, is the makeup of this sea otter. Uh, first off, we have this guy's really fur. The aquarium, we have this little uh, container that you, where you have the ability to touch some of this fur. This fur is super, super soft. It's super, super thick. There's about 1 million hairs square in. So just in the size of the, the hole that we have here, that's about 1 million hairs. Now this hair is super important for this sea otter. Sea otters like this stay about 100.3 degrees, uh, which is higher than our body temperature. And they live in waters that can be from 35 to 60 degrees, which is super, super cold, meaning that sea otters need to stay warm somehow. And this incredibly dense fur is able to do that for them. It doesn't just keep them warm just by having fur. The fur is actually doing something pretty incredible. When they dive underwater, 
air bubbles get trapped underneath this fur and hold air between their skin, meaning that the water all around them isn't actually touching their body at any point. Uh, this does mean that sea otters need to keep themselves clean all the time. You'll see sea otters constantly grooming themselves. They'll even blow inside of their fur to make sure that there's air inside of them. Uh, and when we see sea otters die, we see this big plume of bubbles uh, come up off of their bodies as they, as they dive underwater. We talked about how much food this guy has underneath him, uh, but let's talk about a little about how they actually scavenge for their food. And to do this, uh, I'm going to stand up a little bit, and together, I'm, uh, I hope that you will join me in uh, demonstrating how this, does, how this works. So if everybody at home can go ahead, we're going to lay on our back like a sea otter. You can put your hands up to your chest. And we're going to float on our backs like a sea otter, float on our backs like a sea otter. Sea otters are going to dive down to the bottom of the ocean. So together, we're going to dive down to the bottom of the ocean. And sea otters are going to grab uh, some food, like some mussels or some clams. And now this is the part that gets really cool. Sea otters have really stretchy fur, uh, stretchy skin, that they're able to pull out and make a little pouch out of. So everybody at home, go ahead and take your food and place your food inside of your skin pouch that you've made. And now these animals are one of the few marine mammals that are able to use tools. So sea otters are able to grab rocks, go ahead and grab a rock and place that in your skin pouch as well. And we're gonna together, we're gonna swim back out to the top of the ocean and we're gonna lay on our backs again like a sea otter. We're gonna swim like a sea otter. Now what sea otters are gonna do is they're going to grab that rock and they're gonna grab a muscle and they're going to smash it open. All together, we're gonna smash it one, two, three, ready, smash it open. And then we're gonna eat like a sea otter. We're gonna eat like a sea otter, eat like a sea otter. This is how sea otters eat. Now, like we said, they need to stay super clean all the time. So sea otters are going to go ahead and clean their stomachs, clean their stomachs, and then they're going to grab their skin on their back because it isn't so incredibly stretchy. And they're going to clean their back skin on their stomach as well. These guys are super cool. Like I talked about these sea otters, they are extremely important to the ecosystem of our kelp forest. And a little example of that is uh, when we saw the decline of sea otters off of our coast, we realized how big of a keystone species they really are. Um, and about 1741 is when the sea otter trade started. Uh, before this, it was estimated that off of our coast, we had about 20,000 sea otters swimming around off of our coast. Uh, after this, that the fur trade ended uh, around 1915, uh, it was estimated that there was about less than 50 sea otters that had survived this. Um, Today, luckily, our numbers are a little bit higher. It's estimated that we have about 3,000 sea otters off of our coast. Um, but when we saw the decline of these sea otters, as, as they started dwindling away, we actually don't really have that many uh, off of San Pedro. It's very rare if we're going to see any. Uh, you can see a lot more in Monterey. But when we saw the decline of these sea otters, we saw a boom in sea urchins. We noticed that there were no other animals that were eating as many sea urchins uh, as the sea otter was. And so sea urchins were just able to constantly eat and eat and eat, and they tore away all of our kelp forests that we saw. I actually have an image for you. One second, if I can just screen share. Uh, and this is an example of what we have directly off of uh, our coast here in San Pedro. Uh, this is from Palos Verdes. Here we go. Uh, what you're seeing now, this is a, a photo that we borrowed from the Bay Foundation, but this is a photo that we have uh, right off of our coast, uh, where you can see just the, the difference between the kelp forest that we had before and just how massively uh, these sea urchins can, can populate and just decimate these uh, kelp forests. We know that these kelp forests are able to grow, what, three feet a day? They can grow incredibly fast, and yet these sea urchins are able to destroy all that we have. Uh, and what does that affect? That unfortunately affects uh, the animals that live there, what's protected. Um, so it's, it's really quite interesting when we, when we lost an animal like this off of our coast, just how much the sea urchins were able to devastate this area, which just proves how important it is to protect the animals that live here, to protect the animals like our sea otters, to protect and maintain the numbers of our sea urchins uh, that can ultimately help the ecosystem of our kelp forest uh, thrive and survive a little bit better. Awesome. Well, that's a bit, a, a bit uh, that's all of it here from the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us. I'm going to pass it back over to Casey.
thank you so much uh, for listening to a little bit about kelp forests. Awesome. Thank you, Zach. I actually do have a question to backtrack just a little bit. Um, so you were talking about the sea otters and how obviously they swim a lot. So are the, is their fur water resistant? What makes their fur water resistant? Um, you know what? I think just the density of their fur, because it is it is so thick, there's so much hair. Uh, guessing that the water is uh, has surface tension enough where it's not pushing through the, the density of the fur that it has on its body is okay. my guess. I, I wouldn't assume that it's coated in anything. Yeah. Okay, cool. I was just wondering if it was similar to how beavers, they have that castor oil that they they create and they lick all over and that keeps the water off of their fur. Is it anything similar similar to that? Or is it it's yeah, just- it, very interesting. Yeah, it, it, it is not related to, to that. Uh, it is just the how how incredibly thick uh, these animals fur is. Wow, that's cool. I wish I had a sample to feel right now. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Zach. And thank you, Zoe. Um, we appreciate you guys over at the Cabrillo Aquarium. Um, and that is all of the time that we have for you today. So join us next week so you guys can meet our new special guest. Um, thank you for joining and have a fantastic day. Thank you.